Bienvenue à tous. Merci de votre participation. Pour écouter notre session en français, veuillez cliquer en bas de votre écran sur l'onglet Interprétation et sélectionnez le drapeau français. Hello, bonjour, how are you? Hello. My name is Daniel Adeni, a professional officer at Ecle Africa. My name is Sinetem Bamtetwa, an intern at Ecle Africa. My name is Paul Curry, manager of the Urban Systems Unit at Ikli Africa. On behalf of Ikli Africa, the African Centre for Cities, Our Future Cities and Partners, I'm excited to welcome all of you to the RISE Africa 2021 Action Festival. RISE Africa has been growing as a platform of thinkers, doers and enablers, committed to inspiring action for sustainable cities. RISE Africa is about building active networks across academia, government, private sector, civil society and the arts. Our entry point is not based on articulating problems followed by proposing solutions, but rather on celebrating our cities as places of innovation and culture, while asking what more can we do to make them sustainable, inclusive and vibrant. This festival is hosting 46 sessions from across 16 countries in Africa and the world. Every session aims to share new ideas, showcase ongoing actions and launch new initiatives by bringing participants together to chart a new route forward. We hope that the festival program will inspire you to commit to one of more specific actions that you or your organization will take on. As this session closes, you will be redirected to a survey in which you can articulate these actions. We will follow up on these committed actions throughout the year and offer resources, connections and support. In this way, we are testing the idea that events can galvanize actions and we hope that you will join us in this effort. Beyond the session, there are many ways to take part in the festival. Register for further sessions. Vote for your favorite in the photo competition. Watch a variety of inspiring video provocations. Test your knowledge of African cities from our daily quiz. And listen and dance to the Rise Africa 2021 playlist. We hope that you will make all the attempts to reach out to new people and build long-lasting connections. Before we begin, it is important to note that this session is being recorded and that by participating, you are consenting to be recorded. All the recordings will be available on the program page after the festival. And may I say that creative expression is vital for creating new features for our cities. So we invite you to enter this session in the spirit of creativity and dreaming. Thank you very much. Look at how far you have come. Look at how far you are going from the rubbles of the city to royalty. Yes, you are the stuff that legends are made from. We come from Abantu of the crackling fire, Abantu that come alive around the burning, Abantu that set the air alight with blazing voices, Abantu that chanted for freedom from the front lines, spreading struggle songs from yesteryears like a wildfire, igniting all the way up to touch the skies. Harambe! I come from the urban legends who placed their lives on those lines. I want to be heard. I want our stories to be told. I want our songs to be sung by the children. Go on then, tell the children that they are the stuff that legends are made from. You are, yes, you are the stuff that legends are made from. Good evening and good morning. And good afternoon, uh, as I'm sure that we're coming from many different parts of the continent and many different parts of the world. My name is Michael Sudakasa. I'm CEO of Africa Business Group and the representative of the Private Finance Advisory Network here in South Africa, as well as Eswatini and Lesotho. I also serve on the global board of the Private Sector Alliance for Disaster Resilient Societies, also known as ARISE. Very pleased to welcome all of you on behalf of PFAN, who's the host of this uh, session this evening to the private, private Sector Financing Options for Resilient Urban Infrastructure session. We have 
brought together a very dynamic and very knowledgeable a panel of experts uh, who will share um, more information about uh, resilient urban infrastructure, some of the initiatives that are being developed, why we all should be focused uh, in this space. We have Mr. Abhilash Panda, who is the head infrastructure resilience, a deputy chief interagency cooperation and partnerships branch of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. He also serves as the liaison for the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. We also have Ms. Heather Jackson, who's the CEO of the RBN Fund Managers and co-developer of a very interesting initiative uh, around climate adaptation notes. We're looking forward to learning more about those. And we have Mr. Thavin Naidu, who is the Southern Africa Regional Coordinator of the Private Finance Advisory Network. And what we thought we would do uh, this evening is have these three colleagues share with us information about their organizations, information about the initiatives that they are undertaking in the space of, of urban infrastructure, in particular resilient urban infrastructure. And the, the overarching reason why we brought this particular uh, group together and we wanted to be part of this session is that what is unfolding around the continent is the fact that the public sector and public funds and, and historically infrastructure development uh, was something that governments took on um, as part of their public works department often. But the pace at which infrastructure development is needed on the continent today has outgrown, is outstripping the capacity of the public sector, even with development partner support uh, to develop the infrastructure. We're on a continent that today has roughly 1.3 billion people. And the challenge that our particular municipal governments, because that's where 60% of our population will be in the next uh, three decades, is that we have roughly 330 million new Africans uh, joining the continent's population each decade for the next three decades. So that by 2050, we will have doubled the size of the continent. So when you think of roads, when you think of electricity, when you think of water infrastructure, all of that will need to be developed to support this much larger population than we have today. And we're not gonna be able to do that with just public investment. Similarly, we're in an era of, of climate change and it's rapid in, in various parts of the continent. So we have far more droughts than we had that last longer than they've, they used to. Um, the rainy seasons don't come when they used to. Uh, we have volatile weather that, that, that comes. We, we're seeing uh, volcanoes erupting in, in, in the DRC that had been dormant for many years. And so, with all of these changes uh, that are impacting the continent, the question emerges what role the private sector, in particular private sector finance. And unfortunately, there are colleagues such as those who, who are joining us today who've been really uh, doing deep dives into how to address, in, in many instances, there's a perception of risk. Um, in terms of getting involved in public infrastructure, particularly municipal infrastructure, which is different than governmental infrastructure in the sense that um, for many years, uh, I'll use power projects, grid tied power projects. The, the first thought was to, to seek to get um, the government to, to guarantee the offtake agreement that the national utility uh, might enter into the power purchase agreement. Um, now our governments are, are constrained. Uh, they've already entered into um, the allotment, if you will, of, of power purchase agreements that, uh, that they can. Some are, are not uh, deemed credit worthy in, in global markets uh, because of their credit ratings. And so there's definitely a need for increase collaboration with the private sector, but how do you do that? How do you de-risk de these, uh, these initiatives? Uh, how do you align them in such a way that private 
capital can come, uh, whether it's using blended finance tools or, or innovative climate finance tools. These are the things that we want to, to unpack uh, over the next hour plus. I know we, we said um, that we would take two hours to address this, but uh, we think that we may exhaust it um, within an hour, hour and a half time. I know one of our colleagues, Mr. Avalash uh, Panda, um, has to go at, uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, Central African time. So uh, he'll speak first and we'll engage. Uh, but we will continue the dialogue because we do want it to be uh, an interactive one. Uh, but I just wanted to give uh, all on the call a, a bit of a heads up that we, we may not make it all the way till, till 7 p.m. So with that, I would uh, like to ask... Uh, Ablash, if he would uh, share his opening remarks, we're going to keep this as interactive uh, as we can. So we've asked the colleagues uh, that if they want to share a slide or two, they can. It's not uh, mandatory. Uh, we're, we're going to keep it very um, interactive. At the same time, um, we'd like to ask if you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Um, but after they've all given their opening remarks, you can also uh, use the, the hand functions to raise hands. You should note that at the bottom of your screen, there's an interpretation channel. We have French English interpretation. Um, and in the reactions box, you can raise your hand, give a thumbs up, et cetera. That's an additional way to communicate with us. Uh, but you can also turn on your screen and, and raise your hand. Um, and I'm um, asking uh, my colleague, Cindy Gramney, to just point out um, who may have a hand up if I miss anyone, and also to, to make sure if there are questions in the chat that we, we bring them forward. So I hope that everyone um, is comfortable with that as our, our, an overview of how we, we see the session. And uh, without uh, further ado, uh, I would turn over to Avalash. Thanks a lot, Michael. Uh, thanks, thanks very much for, for this invitation and the introduction and this opportunity to speak at this very important um, gathering. Right? Even if it's virtual these days, it's still a critical gathering that uh, we, we, we deem to speak to. Uh, very interesting, you know, the uh, Rise Africa resonates so much with Arise. And, you know, it's so interesting that you have managed to bridge both Rise Africa and Arise in a way. So, so uh, great work on that. Um, I also picked up an interesting uh, word you used, uh, de-risk. Uh, and we have been using that for a while now. And you know, it comes with its complex challenges when you use de-risk because it's an outcome which we all strive to, but we don't know if, exactly if it's, if it's possible in, 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 in the varied environments that we all live in. Um, I should also apologize in advance for my uh, for my early departure, but uh, you know, things are complex in, in all the environments that we operate in. But uh, let me start by introducing a bit the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Now, UNDRR, that's the abbreviation of itself, uh, is the focal point in the United Nations system for the coordination uh, of efforts in reducing disasters, risks, and to ensure synergies amongst the uh, various entities of the UN, the activities of itself, um, and to support uh, both developed and emerging economies. I mean, we guide, monitor, analyze, um, support implementation of the Sendai framework at local, national, regional, and global level. Now, the Sendai framework was uh, adopted uh, at the third UN World Conference in 2015. The goal of the framework in itself is to uh, is the substantial reduction of disaster risk, losses in lives, livelihoods, health, and the economic, physical, uh, cultural, and environmental dimensions. Now, for the last at least three decades, uh, UNDRR uh, um, has been advocating for and supported. Um, stakeholders to understand the importance of resilience, resilience of infrastructure, particularly the critical infrastructure. And 
in our um, engagement, we have been trying the level base best to increase investment in infrastructure globally, but as much as that, it should be resilient and risk informed. Um, with the adoption of the Sendai framework uh, in 2015, we further increased the emphasis. I mean, now if you see, there are seven global targets and one of them measures reduction in damages to critical infrastructure and continuity of service delivery through building resilience. What's interesting here is that it, it depends a lot how governments define critical infrastructure and what exactly is infrastructure in itself. Um, we, we do not and we have not yet put forward a singular definition on infrastructure. And I don't think we intend to do that. Uh, we would like the member states to do it aptly because the criticality of infrastructure has been evolving and changing with the nature of um, uh, technology development and the processes behind it. Now to um, accelerate uh, the implementation of this target, but also the overall intention or goals of the SDGs, um, we conceived and designed this uh, coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure. Uh, Michael, you mentioned about it that I liaise with that um, coalition, but I'm also pleased to mention that the coalition was actually launched by Prime Minister of India, um, at the U at the Secretary General UN Secretary General's Climate Summit back in 2019, uh, it is a multi-stakeholder global partnership of countries, UN agencies, multilateral banks, private sector, and knowledge institutions. Now, the primary objective of CDRI is to support or promote rapid development of resilient resilient infrastructure and to expand universal access to basic services um, in, in, to its efforts. Its priorities are focused on three specific dimensions. One is technical support and capacity building, research and knowledge management, and advocacy and partnership. As of March, um, I, I don't have a foot, um, you know, uh, it's talking after that. There, uh, there were 22 countries and seven organizations or multilateral bodies that have become um, members of the coalition. Now, this also includes the ARISE network uh, to which Michael, you represent, but also uh, uh, there are other private sector institutions globally uh, as a part of the ARISE. Now we, as I mentioned, um, have conceived the CDRI, but we are also a founding member and now the executive committee member and, and, and we, we support CDRI in the implementation of its three-year work plan. Uh, we would ask, we, are, uh, we aspire and we know that Arise membership globally is now gearing up to also um, help in the delivery of this work plan in the years to come. Um, it's a, as I mentioned, it's a coalition of member states, so, uh, but also institutions and entities. So as long as uh, the external partner or whoever is interested in is willing to adhere to the uh, charter of the coalition, uh, their membership and inclusion in the coalition is very much welcome. Now, um, I'll move a bit uh, beyond uh, CDRI here so that I can put forward a few, few suggestions and areas of work that we are currently looking at. Um, now, we did, a, we did an analysis a uh, few weeks back and uh, to look at how um, what, what does this, what does, how, how do governments actually report on the losses to infrastructure and uh, service delivery? Now we, we, it's very limited. It's, it's very challenging because not a lot of governments are actually reporting properly. And that could also mean that there is not enough data on uh, infrastructure damage and service disruption. Uh, but it's also interesting to see that infrastructure uh, in a lot of contexts has not been yet taken as a solution to a lot of problems that could be addressed uh, by, by using that as a vehicle. Anyway, but we found out that since 2005, on average, more than 3,200 schools, over 412 health facilities, more than 3,000 kilometers of roads have been damaged or destroyed each year in a, in a baseline sample of uh, 83 countries. Now, in addition to the risk drivers that we normally talk about, which is urbanization and unsustainable investment, 
In Africa, exposure to hazards and vulnerabilities to disasters has been reported to be increasing due to um, unplanned urbanizations. Um, but reports have also pointed out that unplanned rapid reconstruction processes have also been uh, the reason behind it. Uh, now, investing in risk uh, prevention um, is a precondition in developing sustainably in, in this changing climate. I mean, I don't think there is a second opinion around it. There was a report saying uh, earlier, uh, towards um, mid of last year, which said that by if we invest roughly 1.6 trillion euros globally between 2020 to 2030 in risk prevention activities, we could actually save 6.4 trillion euros in future losses. Now, this is contextual. This is a global uh, analysis, but it's actually contextual and most would apply in, 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 in various cases. Um, now, disaster risk in sub-Saharan African countries is, uh, is fast changing. Across the 44 countries and during the decade of uh, 2008 to 18, uh, over 157 million people were directly and indirectly affected. In many countries on the continent, the rate of infrastructure development, regulatory structures and risk management capacities have not kept pace to counter new risk associated with rapid population growth, urbanization, and climate change. Um, in 2009, uh, 19, uh, the cyclone Idai caused the destruction of more than 72,000 houses in Mozambique. You know, there, there's also uh, there are house schools and health centers that have been impacted. It impacted supply chain, uh, access to medication and access to safe water, sanitation and so on and so forth. Now, the obstacles for developing robust and resilient infrastructure um, definitely are complex, but it's not just the responsibility of the public sector. Um, it equally uh, bears on the shoulders of the private institutions and private sector and the financing institutional investors and the financing community. Now we know short-term thing, uh, short-termism, um, untested assumptions, lack of local institutional capacities and regulatory frameworks could be um, barriers towards insufficient investment, but there are others also. Uh, it includes lack of established common standards and frameworks. The public-private partnership models are still not properly being elaborated. Uh, procurement means and mechanisms are still not efficiency and um, risk-informed based. Um, there is still the absence of adequate understanding of interdependencies and linkages between infrastructure assets and systems. Um, the nature of system, um, system interdependencies and evolving vulnerabilities could play a vital role, uh, but that needs to be further, not just understood, but also put into practice. What, what, we, what I mean here is this requires regulatory changes and there are regulatory barriers which not just prevent um, resilient infrastructure, but also financing and access to financing and infrastructure. Um, a very clear example in most of the cases is in a lot of countries, there is, there is a lack of pipeline of infrastructure projects. And in absence of pipeline of projects, it's not possible for the financing community to, to steer those resources out there. Now, um, I, could, I could potentially go on and on, uh, but um, I mean, for a long time now, we have been talking about providing the private sector with a meaningful role in disaster risk reduction and infrastructure resilience. And we know the private sector plays a central role in creation or reduction of disaster risk, uh, but, but infrastructure projects and assets require extensive capital investment and often high profile, high value and politically important demanding stability. Now, there's one thing that we need to uh, work towards too is we need to start looking at co-benefits, bankability and pipeline of infrastructure projects. Now, if that could be supported by strong commitment of national governments, it could drive markets interest and foster a stronger partnership between public and private sector. Now I mentioned about PPP models, but um, you know, there are instances in Finland, for example, a companies of, um, yeah, there is a combination of incentives and penalties or have been used to govern the energy sector. Um, another strategy that uh, Finland has been used, has put in use is to share the results of annual assessments of business continuity plans for energy operators. Now, 
there are many examples, you know, we could come across what ha what's happening in South Asia, what's happening in US um, and so forth. But what's important is public finance investment in resilience could assist in setting example and standard for all owners and operators. Um, but we cannot just depend on public finance. We need to start looking at whether uh, you want to call it a new uh, fund mechanism, uh, whether be it's a equity based, based or debt based or a bond market, uh, it needs to learn from uh, you know the cat bonds, the green, uh, the green, uh, green bonds, uh, and we could potentially look at new financing models that focus on prevention uh, or in driven uh, investment. I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier. Um, one is we need to start um, addressing the challenges in the regulatory environment. B, we need to understand interdependencies of assets and the systems behind it. C, we need to open the doors, uh, not just for the private sector to come in, but also we need to open the doors to put in place mandatory clauses around risk disclosure of investments and financing that goes in so that we do not create new risk through these financing. Um, and the last part, uh, and the last item that I would definitely like to look forward to is we need to start stress testing our infrastructure. And that's the only way we'll be able to figure out which asset categories are more exposed than the others. And I think that's where investment is required. If you're not able to put a project pipeline, maybe we start focusing on identifying priority infrastructure requirements where the investments needs to go on. Um, that's all for now. I'll, I'll pause here and pass the floor back to you. And I look forward to hearing the next speakers and you know, maybe answering any questions if there are. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. No, thank you very much, Avalash. I think you've uh, set the, the scene quite well for us. I, I think one of the reasons why we we're keen to have you join us and in your capacity with UNDRR, but also with CDRI is that, um, and you didn't mention this, but it was mentioned in a, an ARISE meeting of those 22 countries at this juncture, and please correct me if I'm wrong, none of those countries are on the continent of Africa. And so one of the, the challenges um, coming out of our uh, ARISE Africa festival uh, to me, would be that we start a process of, of recruiting our, our member states uh, from the continent, um, as well as reaching forward-thinking private sector institutions. Um, we will definitely reach out to the ICLE community to see if, if they are, are so inspired as well. But I, I felt like and, and feel like that being aware of resource institutions uh, where one can share knowledge, where one can see models of, of, of these uh, types of interventions that you mentioned that are needed actually taking place. Uh, one can explore funding models. Um, those are all, I think, critical things to, to moving this conversation forward in the, in the context of, of the continent. I, I want us to, to, to turn a little bit to what actually has been happening, because although um, one might think that Africa is behind, there are some initiatives, particularly in the Southern African context, uh, that are underway and have been uh, being developed over some years now. And so I'd like to ask uh, Heather Jackson, um, who has a, a long, expertise and experience as, as an impact investor in this, in, in this space um, to share with us her thoughts on, um, again, this, this challenge of we do need more private capital, uh, but private capital typically looks for a return. How do we marry those two um, going forward and in the context of, of the African continent? Uh, so Heather, I'd like to shift over to you. Hello and, and good evening to everyone. Thank you, Michael, and, and thank you so much for inviting me and, and Renewable by Nature, RBN Impact Managers, um, to this convening. And I must applaud you. It, it's, it's wonderful to see such a diverse group. Um, you know, normally, where us financial people um, 
all kind of you know preach to the converted and 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 um, so it's really great to see so many people and I, I hope we can engage further that you know I, I'm not quite sure what what people's backgrounds are but I will say as an impact investor and, and you know I migrated from traditional um, investing about 15 years ago um, because my passion was really always impact investing and creating solutions and 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 I will just say as a, as a sort of introduction that our experience over the years with the various teams that I've led um, has been that in creating these, what we call blended finance solutions, they're always hybrid, they're always collaborative. Um, we've had wonderful partnerships across um, NGOs, we've partnered with NGOs, we've partnered with governments, with our government, um, various departments in government, and we've partnered with international DFIs over the years. Um, and it's been very rich, <laughs> complex, yes. Um, but you know the, the, the kind of solutions and the response that you're able to have to really systemic solving of, of issues um, has been incredibly rewarding. And so I think, Michael, what, what you are asking me or inviting us to present to you this evening is, um, is our latest um, crack at finding a solution to some of our systemic um, challenges, specific in the water, specifically in the water and, and sanitation um, sector. And so I'm gonna try and and see if I can share my screen. I hope it works. Um, I've prepared just a few slides. Is this, are you seeing this? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Sorry, I'm just trying to make it not enlarge it. There we go. Um, so, and, and, and please, I'm going to keep it brief and, and invite um, feedback and, and questions. And I, I certainly don't want to want to make it too technical. But in, in essence, we, um, we decided to try and find a funding solution. Heather, in, yes. Can I just ask you to uh, go up to slideshow and just bring it out that way? Is it not showing? No, no, it's there, but I'm saying there's a, a feature called slideshow that just blows up the the screen I have done, it's, it is blowing up on my side is it not on yours no on, on ours it's still at um at home i, I think we can all see it there we go um, so it's blowing up again on mine is it working yeah now 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 we we see it oh, so you can go back to your first slide yeah <laughs> okay all right excellent um so we decided to tackle um you know, the severe water scarcity issues that we have in, in across Africa. I mean, it's, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, only Africa, but certainly in our SADC region, um, we are a very water scarce region. Um, and, you know, in terms of a more inclusionary approach to provision of water and sanitation, we have huge challenges to address. So, you know, over 60, 61% of our population in, in Southern Africa lack adequate access to sanitation, which of course has been exacerbated or the risks around that are exacerbated by COVID, um, as well as access to uh, potable water, to clean water. Um, that number is also distressingly, um, you know, the, the lack of access sits at over 30%, over which is just woefully inadequate. And in South Africa in particular, we've um, being, you know, we've shown some good strides around addressing issues around renewable energy, for example. Um, but, and, and so we felt that, you know, there's a lot of attention paid to that, relatively speaking. And so our focus has been on trying to find a solution around um, financing more consistent, scalable delivery around water and sanitation by stimulating the financial services sector that, you know, we live and breathe every, every day. And what we did, if I, if I just move to the next slide, is we were very fortunate. Um, we put in a proposal to the Global um, Innovation Lab for Climate Finance. I won't go into the background, but happy to share it. Um, and we were fortunate, along with our partner, GFA, to be awarded actually the first mandate in the SADC region, um, whereby they helped us to develop a concept um, around funding for water and sanitation infrastructure. And we worked with them for the most part of, of last year and towards the end of last year, our initiative was endorsed by the lab and 
you can see um, the, 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 all the logos at the bottom depict who the membership of the lab um, are. They have over 60 um, private and, and public large institutions, DFIs, governments, financial institutions, who are including our own Development Bank of Southern Africa, who are members of, of the lab. Um, they launched in 2014 and to date, 49 instruments um, have actually been endorsed by the lab um, and, and, and funded. And as I said, ours was the first in the, in the Southern African region, which we were very proud of. To be successful is an interesting one <laughs> because by definition, it needs to be innovative. So it, it must be a concept that hasn't actually been launched anywhere in the world, as far as anyone is, is aware. It also needs to be catalytic, really uh, implying that it's a blended finance solution. Um, it must be scalable, meaning it's financially sustainable, and it, you must be able to implement it. And so that's currently what we're in, in the process of doing. And I just quickly want to share with you the structure. And if you, you know, oh, sorry, before I, before I get to the structure, um, we were fortunate to commission a survey of South African-based pension funds uh, late last year around their attitudes towards investing across um, social issues, governance issues, and environmental issues. And the standout here, and the only thing I really want to flag um, for the audience is that uh, water use, if you look at environment that, that we've highlighted there, water use was flagged as probably the most important priority sector that pension funds would like to be able to access. Currently, it's very difficult. There, there are no financial products. So we talk about this great need for, for, for funding of particularly infrastructure in the water and sanitation space. And, and, and there's just very, very limited uh, ways for institutions to actually access that funding, which as an impact investor, you know, of course it's a challenge, but it's also a fantastic opportunity. And, and that's certainly how we see it because the, the overwhelming message and, and, and something that I want to really um, leave you with is that is a, a, there's a, there has been a growing and there is, I believe, a very sincere demand for uh, good solutions to invest in from our institutional market. And I'm talking across SADC, across our region, because we surveyed the entire region. So many of you will be aware, and many of you, of course, are, are members of, of you know, relevant pension funds, for example, or pay insurance premiums. Um, collectively, these institutional investors, pension funds and insurers, are the guardians of enormous wealth. Um, and, and I say guardians deliberately, they are custodians. Um, and the belief is, and, 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 and the signaling very strongly is that if they were able to invest more deliberately in social infrastructure, if they were able to invest to enable the delivery um, around social and environmental um, impact areas, such as you know, job creation, um, uh, climate, renewable energy, um, better water provision, um, as if those products were credible, they would be there. And so I think that's part of our journey is to, as impact investors, is to ensure that we create those products that build forward better together in partnership, um, in blended finance um, uh, structures, uh, solutions that, that, that we create, um, but essentially that are addressing huge areas of demand and matching that massive unmet demand um, you know, with, with the supply of funding that we know is out there, is available, and is just asking for, for good, solid uh, impact so solutions. Um, you know, I think, uh, Michael, you mentioned earlier that in terms of the, the growth of our continent going forward, I and mean, I came across, this is a good two years ago, but an incredible piece of, of research um, that posited that currently, while Africa, African cities um, in the top 20, um, number only three, by the end of the century, so 80 odd years out, we're going to be in the top 13. So 13 of African cities will, will be in the top 10 and uh, top 20 in terms of population size. That is a massive challenge. It's also a massive opportunity. Um, and it just you know, highlights again the urgency to scale uh, impact solutions. So, so to get to the heart of, of what we're doing, and I mentioned right in the beginning, this is for, for us as impact investors, you know, my team at RBN are absolutely 
um, convinced that it, these solutions need to be collaborative. And, and I say that because, and, and again, it's a little bit of the yin and the yang of, you know, two sides of the same coin is we tend to work in silos. Certainly in our industry, that is true. And I think in a lot of, in, uh, you know, sectors in our economy. So it might be the NGO sector, it might be the government sector, financial services. Um, and, and there's a, you know, we must be honest, there's a fair amount of mistrust as well. And we've got to break down those barriers and we've got to, Try and move across the these silos that we put ourselves into and ironically even within our own financial services sector i believe we operate in silos and so this is the great i think breakthrough thought um, concept that that um, our solution around water and solution uh, water and sanitation um, is is trying to deliver on so what we've identified in a nutshell is of course we know infrastructure in terms of the challenge infrastructure demand is not met we we've also identified that banks are constrained, they can generally only fund in the relatively short term. Institutional investors, on the other hand, are constrained in that they prefer long-term funding, they have long-term liabilities. Um, and we believe that if we can solve for both of those features, if you like, then we can put together a funding solution that is able to address through the through the, the the continuum of what is required for in for funding water and sanitation infrastructure projects, we can provide the legs that enable that funding. And so, I try to depict this as the two silos being the banks and the pension funds, which is the predominant funding groups that we we are targeting in terms of the funders, the ultimate funders for uh, this water and sanitation infrastructure. And we sit in the middle there as the climate adaptation notes. And essentially we're matchmakers. Um, we've identified the strengths and the constraints for both the banks and the pension funds. And um, for want, and I actually, we we've have lots of ways that we try and depict this, but I was actually ahead of this meeting and, and, and you know, sometimes it's very helpful to know your audience, or I mean, I don't know you, but I, I did um, I have attended some of the other sessions and I know it's a very diverse group. And so I don't want to bore you with financial mumbo jumbo. Um, so I try to think of a very simple way of depicting this. And, and in essence, as the matchmaker, um, our platform, Climate Adaptation Notes in the middle, is in essence solving for both the strengths and the constraints on both sides of the short-term banking funding, the long-term pension fund uh, funding by canceling out this, the, the weaknesses with the strengths. So I'll, I'll, let me explain that a little bit. So the strengths on the banking side is that they know how to originate deals um, and they know, they understand project finance, you know, think of the renewable energy program. They know how to manage that. The long-term pension funds, investors, not so much. Um, they, they, they not, um, they're not skilled in, in evaluating construction risk. They don't like it. And so they shy away at that early stage. On the other hand, the banks are restrained in terms of funding long-term infrastructure projects, which is what we're, we're in the business about. You know, these um, funding a wastewater um, treatment plant, for example, is a, is a, is a long-term project. And the banks are very constrained in terms of Basel III and in terms of their capital adequacy um, requirements. And so it means that if they do fund, it'll be very expensive. But of course, your long-term investors, you know, think of yourselves as, as, as pension fund holders. We want, as pension fund holders, we want long-term assets. We want sure returns. We actually like infrastructure because it quite nicely matches that liability stream that, that, that you have, that payment stream that you want to receive over the next, you know, over several decades. Um, and so what, what, what our program um, is aiming to do is to say we incentivize the banks uh, to conduct the construction finance for a certain period of time, a two to three year period of time. And then that development project that is funding, say that uh, wastewater treatment project is then refinanced by the institutional pension fund. Um, there are a lot of mechanisms and incentives and there's a whole structure behind this that I won't, won't get into it, that I won't get into. But in, in, in essence, we've canvassed this very widely. It's got broad support. Um, and we're now, you know, ready to, to go ahead and, and implement this. And we're very excited about the potential, not just in the water and sanitation space, but more broadly um, in terms of, of funding uh, infrastructure. If we can crack this and we can, we can bring these two 
um, you know, silos to speak to one another and to converge and, and, and work together, um, we think this is a, a scalable uh, solution. And so part of working with the climate lab has been to scope this exercise. So just to quickly, um, the last two slides is just to give you a sense of some of the work behind this. Um, we have identified and, and, and we've um, identified in the first pilot phase where we're looking to raise $125 million. Um, we are looking to uh, invest that and we've scoped a pipeline across South Africa, Lesotho, Botswana and, and Namibia. And the projects that we've identified, of course, it's a combination, again, you know, collaboration is not just on the, the funding side, um, because we envisage, we've been speaking to the DFI community around this as well, um, but also on the pipeline development side. So very much working sometimes with corporate providers, but often with uh, in a PPP, um, you know, type, type of environment. So working very closely with, with those kinds of arrangements in terms of of, of funding this water and sanitation um, infrastructure. And, you know, the numbers vary. I, I wouldn't pin too much on them, but uh, together working with the lab, we identified from various databases about a 7.8 billion, um, and that's in dollars, um, pipeline, which, which does need further, further refining. But, you know, we all know the, the, the you know, the need is out there. The, it, it, it's a matter of actually pulling it together and ensuring that it is um, of, of strong investment quality. And then uh, it would be remiss as an impact investor not to, to end with just a high level overview of the kind of impact we anticipate having. So again, in the first um, pilot phase, we have modeled um, and, and, and matched to the SDGs because I think it's very important and, and, and a very credible framework to uh, deliver on impact returns because we value financial and impact returns equally as impact investors. It's sort of a, if you like, a three-dimensional approach. So managing risk, generating uh, market-related returns and generating verifiable, credible impact. And so we've modeled that the pilot phase, um, given the pipeline we've identified should increase the treatment capacity by at least 90 megaliters a day reach about 90,000 or more community residents um, and also um, go some way towards supporting um, seven of those uh, sustainable the SDGs. And, you know, I, I think if we can do this and then replicate it, um, we will be hopefully providing that demonstration effect and, and the additionality that the, the private sector working together with the public sector really can start uh, making proper inroads into, into solving, um, you know, some of our seemingly intractable <laughs> um, uh, challenges. So thank you. And I really look forward to your uh, insights and, and, and further questions. Well, thank you very much, Heather. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the question is how, how long is a, is a ball of string? I'd love to, you know, get, you're thinking about other of the infrastructure sectors that um, the climate adaptation notes might be uh, relevant uh, within um, as you as you continue to uh, really unpack and, and develop. I, I know at the beginning of uh, the hour, uh, I mentioned to you all that Ablash has to leave us. Um, and so our, our next speaker is, is Thavin Naidu, but I, I wanted to just open the floor if there are any questions uh, for Abilash, uh, just so that um, he would have a, an opportunity to respond. Um, obviously, we're, we're recording the session and um, we would be able to give him the information after the fact, but I, I did want to just recognize um, that if there were any questions for him specifically, um, please feel free to either raise your hand or um, put them in the chat. And while um, I'm not seeing any, um, I'll just introduce our next speaker again, we had a few people join uh, after we, we commenced, uh, but Davin Naidu is the 
head of the Southern African National or Southern Africa Regional um, structure for the private finance advisory network. So the coordinator of, of uh, a constituency very similar to, I mentioned at the beginning that um, we help coordinate activity for PFAN in South Africa, Lesotho and Eswatini, but we're only one of a, a much broader team. And, and Thavin will, will talk about that. And I think it's an, important to recognize as he does that it was really his uh, foresight in thinking that the, the Rise Africa uh, platform might be a, a positive one for, for PFAN, uh, which is how we, we became the host. So I'm looking forward to his talking about that vision, um, why this topic, why Rise Africa, and also to share with you a bit more about uh, the Private Finance Advisory Network and our work. Davin, over to you. Thank you, Michael. Um, as Michael indicated, uh, I am the regional coordinator for PFAN, so we deal with all of the SEDEC countries. Uh, but PFAN is a global organization, which uh, you will see soon. I want to quickly pull up some, some slides. Can you see that? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, so I'm just going to run through uh, um, a quick introduction to PFAN, talk a bit about our, our track record and impact, what happens when a project comes to PFAN, and I'm going to leave out uh, information about the application process and deadlines. Um, so PFAN is essentially a finance facilitation accelerator. And in a way, I'm glad I'm speaking last because, you know, Abhilash managed to paint this, this big picture of the kind of challenges that we have and the role of the private sector. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's clear that in terms of the kind of finances available, there is not enough public sector finance and the private sector will have to play a role. And that role is definitely based on the fact that there's a lot of projects uh, out there that are looking for financing and there's a lot of money out there that's looking for projects and we try and bridge that that gap essentially helping projects to speak the language of investors so addressing what the investors concerns would be and structuring a project in a way that would be suitable for the private investor to look at Sorry. So what we do is we provide uh, facilita facilitation to, to projects at no cost to the entrepreneur. Um, we pay the, the, the professionals who provide these services uh, from funds that we have um, that, uh, that, that are provided to PFAN by a range of, uh, of people who support our work. Um, their work is also supported by network partners. These are people who basically ensure that we, we, we have a good pipeline of projects coming in, but they also help us in other, in other ways. We've been operating since 2006, and in 2016, we became hosted by Unido and, and REAP. And that has basically allowed us to substantially scale up our operations. And essentially what happens is a, we have an open portal that, that, that uh, projects can apply onto. We evaluate them, uh, generally two or three evaluators. And then based on projects that we select, we provide the, this free business advisory, hope, hoping that that will take a project to financial close. If there are issues at the point of financial close, we can provide some form of uh, uh, tipping point uh, technical assistance funds. And at the end of it, we provide uh, the introduction to investors. Clearly, we don't provide uh, funding as such, unless of course there is a committed funder and there is something that's outstanding. You know, it could be a legal contract, it could be a particular license that a project may need. 
but we don't generally provide funding as such. We provide the advisory for projects. Um, gender is, is becoming increasingly important in all of the work that we do. And we definitely look at projects with a gender lens. So we look, you know, in terms of ownership, in terms of manage, uh, management, in terms of worker employees, and in terms of beneficiaries. You know, we score, we score for gender in, in, in all of these categories. So definitely projects that have a very, very good gender balance have a much stronger chance of getting through our processes. So as I indicated, we're a global network um, across multiple regions. In Africa, we have three core regions. We have West Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. And we work as a virtual network. So within the Southern African region, we have 10 countries in which we have actual PFAN representatives like Michael, uh, who represents us for South Africa, Swaziland, uh, Eswatini and Lesotho. And, you know, we have, uh, as I say, we have other countries uh, as well that uh, we have people on the ground. Um, we open to projects that uh, are essentially climate adaptation and mitigation. So the sectors are, are varied. You know, um, for adaptation, they could come from agriculture, they could involve biodiversity, they could involve urban resilience, water and sanitation, tourism. And on the, on the mitigation side, they could involve clean cooking, cleaner technologies, electrification, um, energy storage and, and, and conservation. And we're really technology agnostic. So we're not that concerned about what the technology is, although the climate rationale uh, is, is extremely important. Sorry, this thing is just jumping all over. Um, so to date, we've raised just under $2 billion for projects, um, and that's about uh, under 160 projects. We have a success rate of about one in five. Um, of course, that's one in five projects that we work with, although the actual projects that come in that, we, that, uh, that apply to us are many more. So we've supported in excess of a thousand projects and currently have a pipeline of over 300 projects. And, you know, you can see the, 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 the volume of new uh, power generation and the avoided emissions as a result of that. Here's an example of a project that came to PFAT. It's an extremely small investment. Uh, generally, we don't like these small investments because, you know, uh, the transaction cost, the, the, the effort that's put in is as much as a bigger project. And it's not that easy to find in, uh, investors who are interested in these smaller projects. A project like this, uh, which is also in Nigeria, is much more to our liking and to investors' liking. Um, ideally, for us, we look at projects anywhere between a million to 50 million, although, you know, as I said, we, we will look at smaller projects, and we have also dealt with larger projects. What do we look for? <clears throat> in, in the projects that we look, uh, we look at, uh, the, the management team is critical. You know, the, 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 no project will move forward without a good jockey driving it. Uh, the development in, uh, and gender impact are critical. Of course, there has to be a climate impact. The growth potential is, is a significant uh, area. You know, if it's a smaller project and we can see that it has scope to, 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 to scale, scale up or scale out, uh, we're, we're much more in, interested in it. And of course, you know, critically, it has to be commercially viable and technically viable. And you know, this is what some of the investors say about us. You know, essentially, what we do is we help prepare projects for investors and bring down the, the transaction, the transaction uh, efforts on the investor side. 
And in working with projects, we help the project developers identify the critical risks that an investor would be concerned about and, and find ways to mitigate that risk. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, that. Savin. Um, I think it's uh, valuable for the for the colleagues um, to to have a sense of where support can come from as we we move in this direction. I think the point that you you mentioned right at the onset that there are private sector project developers who are struggling to find capital, but equally importantly that there's private capital that is looking for projects. I think often in the, the public sector, the stakeholders uh, are not aware that there is private capital looking for projects. And I think that that work that PFAN is doing and uh, we're trying to double down and expand on that is key. Uh, and I also think that the, the gender lens through which projects are, are approached is also, is also critical. So we, we've had our three key interveners give their, their remarks. Uh, Ablash, who unfortunately had to, to leave us, um, provided kind of a, a global overview of, of what in terms of trends are happening and talked about CDRI as a relatively new organization that has 22 member states, but also has partners who are not in the public sector uh, and is growing. Um, we're hoping that out of this, this session that we wouldn't just have found it uh, informative, um, that it may lead to, to further activities. Um, in Heather's presentation, she, she noted that, um, and it's a term that I used uh, when I looked at kind of a list of who had uh, RSVP'd for our session, we're an eclectic, diverse group. And, and I wanted to start our conversation by uh, one, allowing feedback uh, from anyone who had a question or uh, who had a, a comment. Uh, the, the presentations that have been given, uh, we'll definitely share with the organizers and, and then they can uh, disseminate them uh, going forward. Um, so that, that would allow everyone to, to do a deeper dive into to the two uh, PowerPoint presentations that were shared. Um, Michelle, Michelle Kasha, did you have a, a question that you wanted to ask? I, would, I, I know that uh, this hour of the day, sometimes it's, uh, you've been on Zoom for some time, but if you could turn on your camera when you ask your question, then it feels a little bit more like we're all together in a, in a meeting, which is what we were trying to accomplish. Um, so if you have a question, uh, please ask it um, and direct it to, to whomever you'd like. And, and then I'm going to, um, barring a lot of questions, reach out to some of you to kind of get uh, a better sense of what attracted you to this discussion. And so then we'll, we'll have more of a, a conversation. Michelle, did you have a question or? Yes, Michael. Good afternoon. Good, good evening. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just have a question for, for Mr. Uh, Naidu, the last presenter, about uh, the process of going through uh, the entire uh, cycle with PFAN. Is there any timeline uh, from his own experience that he can share with us? And also the second part of the question is, in case uh, we submit a project with them, here I'm talking as a representative of a couple of uh, private sector and SMEs initiative. Uh, does it, if it's required for, for PFAN teams to come and visit us uh, in country, how is the costs and the costs of those, those trips can be handled? How are they handled? That's, that, these are the two questions that I have for you. So number one, it's about the process itself. 
how how long does it take? And number two, if there's a trip required, how how is it handled? Thank you, Michel. So you know the reality is most people when they need finance, they they want it immediately. Um, it it hardly ever works like that. It's a very very long um, development process. For PFAN, what happens is that we have an open portal so people can, can apply at any time that they want. Uh, we try and, because there's a long process in, in the background that needs to happen, we try and wait till we have enough projects together for us to convene a evaluation session. And we definitely do it at least every three months. Um, although if there's an urgent project, if there's particular time frames that a project has to meet, we can convene uh, specially and, and fast track an application. Um, and when it, once we have evaluated it and we select a, a project to work with, we hope that the professional that we allocate to a project will be able to, within nine months, actually be able to put you in front of a investor. It doesn't always happen that way. Um, uh, so, you know, in some cases it takes much longer, especially when the project is very early stage. And it can also happen much quicker than that. Um, if a project has really got all its, uh, all its information together, all its licenses in place, everything is clear, they've got their financials up to scratch, we can really move a project fairly quickly. So it's actually up to the developer. Uh, of course, there's the time lag from the time you apply to the time it gets reviewed. You know, there's not much we can do there unless, unless there's a special request. Um, but yes, we, you know, we, we can make that shorter, but generally it would be, you know, depending on when you apply, if you apply just after a, a, a review uh, process, you know, it would take three months, but it would be shorter than that in most, in most cases. And I'm not sure what country you're from, Michelle, but you know we have a lot of people uh, in, in, in the, in, in across the regions in Africa. Um, what, what country are you from in particular? Uh, I am in uh, DRC, Congo, in Central Africa. I'm hoping that we will be able to identify a country coordinator for DRC sometime this year. We're seeing a lot more projects come through from the DRC um, and we can see that there is a need. There's obviously huge opportunities there, both in terms of adaptation and mitigation. So we'd be very keen yeah. to have somebody there. But generally, we don't visit the site of the on, entrepreneur, of the project developer, unless there is a specific need. And mm -hmm. whatever happens in that, in that uh, instance, PFAN would pick up its own costs for, for that. So we don't lean on the developers for any costs uh, in the process of engagement with PFAN. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Sure. Any other thoughts or, or comments? Um, very curious to know who, who we are and again, what has attracted us to to this subject of resilient infrastructure and also keen to know, particularly if you're from outside of Southern Africa, um, what initiatives may be taking place on your part of the continent. Um, you know, the theme of, of Rise Africa and the desire to have this be an action um, catalyzing event resonates quite a bit. Um, and so we're also keen to get your thoughts on how we might uh, promote this subject more broadly in different parts of the continent. Clotilde, can I, can I reach out to you? Because you've been with us from the beginning of our conversation and you said you were coming to us from New York. What, uh, what inspired you to join us? Can you just bring your 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 microphone a little closer because we can't hear you. Your audio is a little low. Not so much. You still sound like you're way away. Okay. Can you hear me? 
Can you hear better? That's a little bit better, but people are, you know, yes, so, okay. shaking their heads a little. <laughs> What I'm hearing you say is you're interested in public health. You're from DRC Congo? No, I am a public health expert and a medical okay. doctor. And medical doctor and public health expert. Okay. Yeah, this is what I am. And I've been involved into putting together a capital equity fund to invest in the food. You've put together, Michelle, can you just mute? Thank you. So Clotilde, you've put together an equity fund looking at food? We've been working with friends to put together an equity fund, uh, um, a capital equity to invest in the food value chain with women in the rural area. Okay, so to invest with uh, women in rural areas in the food value chain. Yes, this is it. So uh, I came across this event and I wanted to learn about what you do, sample of financing, and I find it very interesting. So I met a very okay. early stage of my startup Okay, so at early stage of project development and, and joining us with a desire to, to learn more and, and, and network, I imagine. Yes, yes. Charles, is your hand up? Tonua? I may not be pronouncing that exactly right. Trish's hand is up. Trish? Was there Trish? Please. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I have a background in so like uh, public health and most recently just ventured into um, urban health. And um, I was particularly interested in this um, um, in the session today because so one of the projects that I've been working on is looking into um, green building projects in sub-Saharan Africa. So initially started up with sort of like interest around green housing, like um, green affordable housing in South Africa. And so in Africa generally, and then it got me thinking around because mostly because there are very few projects to be honest, <laughs> I then decided to broaden it to um, the general field of green building. And so one of the things um, I got into this was looking in terms of what are sort of like the health considerations that are included within these, these green building initiatives or green building projects that have been currently done. And also as an and uh, sort of like a tangent to that in terms of how are these health considerations also in, in, in sort of like considered by people who then finance the green building initiatives. So it's quite interesting um, listening to around, you know, sort of like the challenges and um, the challenges around financing, what sort of projects are financed. And so I was wondering um, to the last speaker who was speaking around um, some of the projects that they work on, do they specifically have um, any projects in this field of green buildings? And also is sort of like health a consideration when we sort of like decide on which projects to invest in? Sorry, that was a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> sure, I think that, mm -hmm. that was directed to you um to talk to us about green building investment that uh, pfan may may support thank you for that question um so you know pfan works across all kinds of sectors and when we look at adaptation of course you know if you look at the the population shifts adaptation is important and we've included in their uh, uh, health as well. But you know, the reality is that within any project, there is both the public component and the private component. And mm -hmm. it's very difficult for PFAN to support the public, for, for, for the private investor to support mm -hmm. the, the public component of that. 
So if you look at green buildings, there is a part of the pure structure that would be required in any case. Then there are add-ons that basically make the building green, that give it its green credentials. And within that, you can look at, for example, the emission savings. And it's that component of the, the green building that could receive support from, from PFAN in terms of the PFAN investor network. That being said, there are a lot of urban funds that are developing that um, essentially green bonds that look at these kinds of projects more holistically um, to build up their, their portfolio. So I think that you know, going forward, there will be a lot more of these opportunities. Right now, we haven't seen enough of them come through, but that's also perhaps because PFAN is, is transitioning from mitigation into more uh, uh, adaptation uh, and adaptation focus. We won't lose the mitigation focus, but certainly adaptation we see becoming a much larger part of the work that we do. I hope that answers your question. Right. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. yeah. If I may come in here, because it's an area Please. that um, we've had a lot of um, experience in as well, is I think it's a very interesting area. Um, of course, it's, and, and, and thanks for the question, Trish. I, I think on, on two levels, you know, the first, of course, is to acknowledge that in the COVID um, environment, property has really been knocked hard. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very challenging. Um, in, in terms of, you know, additional spend um, a, a around retrofitting existing building stock to um, kind of green star building status. Having said that, though, it's there are other factors at play here. So, I mean, there, there, there are two main areas um, in, in our environment. The one is that there's this huge unmet demand for more affordable rental stock that is well located. Um, that is good quality, well located, closer to jobs, closer to amenities. Um, and we've supported a number of organizations over the years um, by way of, um, you know, investing, investing in them, the likes of, of TA, the Trust for Urban Housing Foundation, who do incredible work, um, essentially investing in inner city slums around South Africa, um, refurbishing buildings, creating really good quality um, rental stock. Uh, affordable rental stock and you know one of the dynamics at play which is really interesting is that um, some of the biggest risks that these housing property developers face are administered prices um, and so actually when they are refurbing buildings that are that is sort of more sensitive to the green um, you know the climate agenda um, around introducing more um, you know renewable energy strategies solar um, heat, uh, water systems, um, you know, a whole, a whole range of interventions that are essentially, you know, looking to building in a more sustainable manner and, and accessing energy and, and, and water and even clean air to, I mean, you both, the, the previous um, people, you know, um, are, are health practitioners. And so the quality, air quality control in any living space, in any commercial or, or residential living space has has really been prioritized as well. But in doing so, you're also combating one of the greatest risks, which has been administered prices. So, you know, we faced huge escalations around energy, around um, particularly energy, but, but other administered prices as well. And so it's actually quite a, a defensive strategy. And surveys, I know for uh, our largest um, green building proponent in the South African context, being Growth Point, um, the buildings that they, and they're about 22% certified green building, and we've, we've worked quite closely with them, is that those buildings have actually been shown to outperform the, um, the non-green certified. So certified from a, a star four, five, or even in some rare instances, six star uh, green building certifications. Um, those buildings have really noticeably outperformed their, if you want to call it traditional um, building, building stock. And they've done so in terms of lower vacancies, they're, they're more appealing. The capital returns on those buildings has also been stronger in part because of course they are now combating these, this rise in administered prices. So for us, 
as impact investors, it's very exciting to see how um, the financial, um, uh, if you like, optics of, of, of this, as well as the impact optics are really talking to each other. Um, and so, yes, I, I think there's massive potential. Uh, student accommodation, nursing accommodation is, is another one. And finding ways to, you know, particularly to look to, um, I don't think enough attention potentially was paid to the quality of uh, air quality control in these buildings, but that's certainly on the agenda now. And I think, you know, it will be one of, um, one of the trends emerging out of COVID that that, in addition to reducing, um, you know, wastewater and, 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 you know, moving towards net zero on, on wastewater treatment, on water treatment, as well as um, air, um, uh, sorry, energy um, and, you know, carbon emissions and, and achieving net zero in terms of those um, um, targets that, you know, have been in place now for some time. I think air quality control is also going to be a really important, um, <clears throat> you know, cr uh, criteria and metric that will be measured uh, going forward in, in buildings. No, thank you. I want to um, ask uh, if there are other questions from, from the audience. I, I know that at the, the onset, I mentioned to you that we may or may not make it all the way to seven, but I, I don't want us to, to drag out and people feel like teeth are being pulled here to ask questions. Um, but I saw that uh, you raised your hand uh, with another comment. So please do go ahead. Yeah, I, I would actually like to uh, ask Heather a question. Um, and, you know, in, in, within PFAN, one of the important criteria that we are identifying with regards to adaptation projects is how do you define it as an adaptation project? And it would be interesting to understand how the climate adaptation notes are going to create, uh, going to articulate the, the, um, the validation of the, the climate adaptation criteria of any water project. Yeah, no, thanks, thanks, um, Tevin. So <clears throat> I think, you know, we've done a lot of work with, with the lab around, um, developing the, both the criteria and the metrics around um, you know, how, we will, how we will measure. So for example, if we look at water supply and, and, and treatment, um, we, we look at you know, how we reduce the repair costs, for example, after extreme, say, storm, storm events. Um, we would look to measure the, the decrease in frequency of, of days or weeks of, of water use restrictions. Um, Similarly, for wastewater collection and treatment, for irrigation, for smart, smart technologies, the application of, of smart technologies, for example, in, in agriculture, um, we feel that adaptation has probably been rel uh, you know, relatively neglected uh, compared to um, mitigation. And that's another reason why we were attracted to this. Um, so, for example, if we look at irrigation, you know, we, we would want to see um, the percent of cropping area with enhanced, um, you know, technologies helping to retain um, uh, soil water uh, better, um, and and you know, so that's just sort of by way some of some of the examples. Um, but you know, I must be honest, we were surprised when we set out to identify a pipeline that fulfilled adaptation um, criteria that there was such a, a rich vein um, of 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 potential pipeline um, because you know adaptation and, and, and finding strategies to better use what we have um, is such an important component of creating more resilience um, in, in the system. Davin, is that um, does that answer you <laughs> helpful to to your understanding? I mean I, th I think that um, as we, we dig deeper and, and there are more examples, um, Heather, of, of adaptation projects that are, are funded and, and operating, I think that we will pick up and see more of those types of projects. I mean, there's a lot more conversation about particularly the integration and the, the, the nexus of, of particularly agriculture and energy. 
um, and, the, and the catalytic impact that can be had by bringing uh, electrification closer to the farm gate. And so as, as I think there's, there's more also returns from those private investors who have uh, stepped out first, um, that will drive other, other capital into that sector. So looking forward to that. Yeah, can I yeah. respond to very quickly, um, Microsoft? You know, in, in, in climate mitigation, uh, the metrics are, are, are fairly clear. You know, it's in, in a new energy uh, generated and in avoided emissions. And I think it's really important for project developers to start understanding that if you're looking at an adaptation project, the, the, the approach is a lot more complex. And project developers have to start developing the skills to articulate projects in terms of those kinds of criteria. And, you know, for climate adaptation notes, uh, there was a particular process that was followed. For project developers, they need to look clearly at what are the climate models saying about what is the future climate going to be. And you have to clearly identify which of those impacts does your project um, start attempting to deal with. And you then have to also consider the fact that once you implement the project, are you going to be able to measure what your project has actually achieved? So the, on the one hand, coming into the project, you need to understand what is it, uh, what, what problem is it trying to, to address? And on the other hand, once it's implemented, you need to be able to say, well, have I actually achieved what I intended to achieve? And I think that, you know, very often, even in the mitigation, uh, the, the time when we were doing just mitigation, a lot of project developers didn't understand that, you know, you had to measure it in terms of new generation and avoided emissions. Now with adaptation, it's a lot more complex and really project developers need to come up to speed on that particular issue, the articulation of the climate credentials of the project. You, you touch on a very important um, area, Thavan, which is that, you know, we, we're trying to stimulate more impactful investments, um, working with, with private sector developers, but not all of them, of course, understand, you know, they understand returns, they understand that dimension, but they don't necessarily understand or articulate or measure the, the impact that is being achieved. And so, you know, with previous uh, impact solutions, most recently, our collaboration with our National Treasury's Jobs Fund program, um, the companies that we invested in who were expanding and creating jobs, um, we needed to articulate a very clear, first of all, for ourselves, theory of change. Of course, we don't scare the <laughs> developers with, you know, with, with that, but we had a very clear theory of change within our own identity. And then it was a matter of negotiating how, what was feasible, and how we would be able to uh, measure the job creation in a credible manner um, post the loans that we made, and then and then ensure that we had a means of verification. So, um, you know, whether it was an agreed proxy, whether it was an employment contract, and, and we had to be very particular about how we achieved that. And I think that that's, you know, that intentionality of measuring impact is, is crucial, and to set that up, up, up front. I think in many instances in this space, you know, for example, um, I actually came across one uh, just just today. Um, some of your consulting engineers, um, you know, who work on on, on the delivery of, of, of some of these big climate related and, and you know, particularly I'm thinking in the water space now. Um, I'm just looking at their name, the, the greenhouse um, of consultant engineers who are very much up to speed with you know creating impact. Um, and, 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 you know, some of them, you know, to a lesser or greater extent will, 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 will be there. Um, but agreed, it's a, it's, a, it's a process, it's an engagement. It's a, again that, you know, it's a collaboration in terms of ensuring that you're able to demonstrate um, credibly that the, the, the kinds of interventions, the kinds of impact that you think are being achieved in this instance, in terms of, you know, adaptation criteria are actually delivered at the end of the day. And that's, you know, I guess one uh, element that our, 
our team at RBN has has prided itself over over the years of of understanding and appreciating that alongside returns, um, impact financial returns, I should say, uh, impact returns are also very important to safeguard from the outset, you know, through the through through the process. Um, so so yes, I, I yeah. know that that's certainly very important. I, I want to pick up um, two colleagues who have raised some questions, Heather and. And Thavin, Charles has had his hand up. And also, uh, Harold, you had a, a question as well. So if the two of you could, could pose your questions or give your, your comments and thoughts, that would be appreciated. Charles? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael. Uh, so uh, it, uh, I was well up in traffic in I mean, Nairobi. I'm uh, Charles Chonus and researcher fellow with the Africa Research and Impact Network, and also with the African Center for Technology Studies. I'm currently uh, leading a Nairobi City uh, Disaster Risk uh, Policy Analysis under the U UKRI uh, Global Challenge Research Fund uh, tomorrow's uh, cities. And uh, thanks a lot for Safin. He really brought out especially the areas around um, uh, metrics for measuring mitigation. Uh, I'm, uh, we are part of the international uh, platform for adaptation uh, uh, metrics, and we are finding it quite challenging, especially in the African context, um, to really identify uh, the metrics for measuring adaptation and mitigation, especially from the context of uh, the fast uh, growing uh, cities, major cities like, like Nairobi. And that is the area that I, I'm trying to look at in the policy space. What are, what are the perceptions and the contributions, especially from the high level uh, policymakers and it's not uh, coming uh, out uh, very easily. So I think Rice Africa, you have really have a very nice program. And if I can get a uh, comment around so that we can, uh, because I think we have identified also ICLE and uh, Rice Africa is part of the team to contribute to the adaptation and metrics in the upcoming uh, meetings uh, under the international platform for adaptation uh, uh, metrics. And I hope Michael will accept to invite you to some of our forum and seminars in the course of the year. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, thank you for that intervention, Charles. I I'd like to say as well, because um, I've seen a few people drop off, if you are interested at all in continuing this conversation, would you please, in the chat, just put your name and your email. Um, the, the colleagues from Rise Africa did not ask in advance if they could share um, anyone's data. So they, they said that if we wanted to engage with any of the others who, who join our respective sessions that um, we could ask that question. Uh, and I'll also just put my email in the chat uh, in the event that you'd like to follow up. Um, I wanted to, um, Charles, and, and you made a comment as much as you made a question. If you, if you had a pointed question, at Davin or, or Heather, please please let me know so that I don't miss that. Um, but Harold, I, I, I would defer to you as well to, to allow you to ask the question that I think you put in the chat um, out loud to everyone. Okay, thank you very much for the floor. Um, I have two questions. Oh, my name is Harald Schütt. I'm the country coordinator for PFAN in Namibia. And I wrote an article, 100% Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency in Namibia, and gave a TED talk to that subject. So uh, we have a lot of bush encroachment in Namibia. That is a very huge resource. We're talking about some 40, 400 million tons. That is an absolute, very big resource. And uh, there are some, projects trying to convert that into electricity, that bush. So my first question is, does anybody have experiences with hybrid systems between PV photovoltaics and bush, for example, or photovoltaics and biomass or biogas or something like that, where we can learn from? Because one of my activities is to try and pump more money into the rural areas so that we can mitigate rural urban migration. Um, that is the first one. <laughs> Let me just look. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and the other one is, are there experiences in this round with mini and micro grids? You know, Namibia is a vast country. We have a, have a population density on average of 2.8 people per square kilometer. So you must stand on your tiptoes to see the person you're sharing your square kilometer with. So uh, only 48% of population is on grid. And it would make, in my view, a lot of sense if we would be able to do more mini grids and combine them with productive activities. So I would like to see whether I can learn something from you people, if any of you has experiences with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Harold. I mean, we, we can have um, a bilateral, uh, but that's an area of, of interest uh, as well. Um, and their colleagues that uh, I know that are in Costa Rica that are developing biogasification, kind of circular economy initiatives and looking to actually bring that technology to the Northwest province here in South Africa to uh, an organization called the Coral Farmer Training Center and develop a, a hybrid demonstration facility um, in conjunction with the, the provincial government of the Northwest province. So um, happy to continue that conversation. And again, it's focused on the, the harnessing of productive uses and economic development use, if you will, um, to create the demand and the load factor to make mini grids um, commercially viable and, and sustainable. David? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to just comment on, uh, um, on, on, on the issue of building urban resilience by reducing the rural urban migration. I mean, I think that's a fascinating uh, approach. And certainly, if, if you look at that, um, there, there are a lot of opportunities in terms of creating rural enterprises. But, you know, Harold, that's really one of the, the big, big challenges, not just in Namibia, but across the developing world, is how do you create uh, enterprises that are at a suitable scale for the local environment. You know, you could have three villages within a 10 kilometer radius, and each of them is at different scale. And actually that 10 kilometers is a distance too great to, to, for, 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 for one village to get to the other. I mean, we worked in a, in, on a project in, in, in Mozambique where the distance from the village to the local town was 11 kilometers and there was actually no transport. So if you produce goods, if you produce vegetables in the village, it was actually difficult to get it 11 kilometers only. But I think that that's a fascinating approach. And certainly, I mean, I think that uh, there are a lot of examples of hybrid systems that, that we, could, uh, we could start uh, looking at. But also to pick up on your, um, on your mini grid uh, idea, you know, if you look at uh, rural populations, again, a lot of them are so distant from, from all of the kind of resources to make it work that in some cases it's really difficult. And a lot of developers, mini grid developers, are now looking at peri urban areas to look at which are the peri urban areas that are unserved by the grid or that you know, grid capacity simply cannot add them on. And those, again, become very interesting opportunities for mini-grid developers. So on both your points, I think there's, a, there's very interesting opportunities to, to look at. No, thank you. And, and Charles you. Has, has put into the chat a question, what kind of tensions and synergies and adaptation and mitigation metrics uh, exist in urban areas toward implementing uh, resilient projects. Um, I think, you know, one of the, and I'm, I'm this is kind of for, for our, our illustrious panel as well, um, but I know we, we did some work some years back for the National Development Agency here in South Africa looking, as, as Davin mentioned, how do you create linkage, infrastructure linkages that bring in rural communities, because your, your urban areas are typically where you're going to have um, the market. 
and the population base, but you can get benefits in terms of cost of production in rural areas, but you have to make sure that you have the infrastructure that allows you to move product and people um, in between. So there's a, there's a, a storage capacity uh, in the urban area that needs to be developed. If you're, again, in agriculture is a, a default sector that we often fall back on just because it's, it's such a big part of, of uh, the economy in terms of, of job creation, even when it's not as large in terms of uh, a segment of, of GDP. But in many countries on the continent, you have uh, from 50% to 70% to of an economy somehow involved in food production. And so as you build infrastructure outward from your urban areas to your rural areas, two, you actually increase the flow of, of, of produce uh, from where it's produced to where the markets are. In, in, in some instances as well, there's been a move towards uh, soilless farming in urban areas because you often have uh, urban food pockets or uh, hunger pockets, or poverty pockets. Um, and so to reduce the reliance on, on farther flung farming, um, you're seeing tunnels developed, hydroponics, aquaponics um, developed in urban areas. And in South Africa, that's the case in uh, our large metros, um, Johannesburg, Cape Town, there have been initiatives in this area. So I think that the, 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 the linkage infrastructure between the urban and the rural areas is where there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. Um, and in terms of developing, again, energy for us has, has been a, a critical one because your coal chain is relying on energy, your ability to, to pump water, um, to clean water, um, to charge phones, all of that is relying upon uh, electrification. And so that's to us been a kind of a priority uh, sector going forward. And so Heather and, and Davin, I don't know if, if either of you have um, any points that you'd like to, to kind of add, but our overarching theme was, was to kind of bring us back about urban, ag urban infrastructure and resilient urban infrastructure. Um, so if, if we could take a moment to kind of think about, you know, what drives that, what's needed for that to be developed um, again, in the energy space, you know, so much of the challenges, I'll use Nigeria, which is kind of uh, illustrious for this. You, you have NEPA, uh, and there's been uh, a grid, but if it only works 20% of the time, it's like you don't have electricity. And, and if you think about the cost of funding infrastructure development in the, in the metro areas of the continent, um, very few governments have the resources to do that. And, and you know, with all the pressures of urbanization, all the pressures of um, the fact that we're, we're, we're seeing this rapid population growth, in addition to the urbanization, people moving from the rural to the urban, um, I think that's gonna be our challenge. How are we gonna keep up? Go ahead. So Michael, maybe just a comment just in, 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 in closing from my side is, you know, I spoke in the beginning about the tendency to, to silo. Um, I think perhaps, you know, it's, it's useful in terms of, of definitions to distinguish between mitigation and adaptation, but I don't think we necessarily need to, to think in boxes around that either. And, um, you know, I think that the, the big thing is we need to find sustainable funding solutions um, to solve for all the very many challenges we we understand that that we that we face, and I think a, a great way of perhaps, um, or you know, an area that I would like to flag um, in, in terms of closing comments is the confluence or the nexus of of the two. When you look at a very powerful movement that is um, built up around just transition. And so you see the marrying of, of the two uh, in terms of, of, of solving for a very complex um, problem. Um, and you know, if we look in our geography, we, we look to a province like Mpumalanga and we say, how, how do we migrate um, you know, away from dirty fuels? And how do we simultaneously solve for the challenge of job losses, 
for the challenges of uh, pollution levels, for the challenges of degradation of, of soil. And if we were to solve around food security, for example, in, in what should be a very fertile um, area, and if we were to solve for you know, a mitigation strategy, because you know, food, would, that would be more of an adaptation strategy, but we also to simultaneously solve for the migration to cleaner energy solutions um, and renewable energy in, in a more mitigation strategy. And if we could get that right, and if we could bring on partners across uh, industry, you know, mining, agriculture, communities, um, you know, governments, DFIs, um, you know, if, if, if one had that convergence um, of, of interest, of understanding, of a, a desire to solve, um, the, the ingredients are all there. Um, and so for, for me, again, trying to leverage um, finance at, at scale, I think we need to think system, you know, systemically like that and think about how can we bring all of this and it's, they all should fit together. They should all be pulling in, in, in the same direction. Um, and it's a wonderful challenge to solve around, but it's both mitigation and adaptation. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's necessarily, it might work in some instances, but how much more powerful is it if we can solve simultaneously um, and, you know, have positive environmental and social outcomes at the same time, which I think is so important in our context that it can't just be about the, the environment either in the same way that it can't just be about mitigation or adaptation or separating them, but bringing together solving for social um, and environmental challenges simultaneously. And I, I, I'll leave Kevin, you had your, I thought you had your, your hand up as well. Um, and, and, and as Heather pointed out, I, I'd like you also to frame this kind of in your, your closing uh, remarks for the conversation. You're on mute, Evan. Um, Thanks, Michael. Yeah, yeah no, so I, I think it's been a good discussion. Um, I mean, I think there's a few points that have come up. The, the one point that we haven't talked through adequately is the issue of uh, public goods and private goods and whose responsibility is a climate resilient infrastructure. Uh, you know, in an urban area, you could have a green building, but whose responsibility is it to ensure that you have localized waste treatment or, or you know, more efficient means of, uh, of recycling. So I think that very often there are interesting business opportunities that will be thrown up by the climate challenge. And those opportunities are obviously in the, in, in the, in the realm of the private sector. So it's very, it's very uh, encouraging to see people taking the challenge and turning it into an opportunity. Uh, but there is clearly a role for public funds as well. And, you know, uh, as Abhilash indicated that the public-private partnership model is not really generating enough uh, project traction. So one needs to look at a mix of solutions. And, you know, it's, it's why I'm so attracted to the climate adaptation notes because it does that. It actually looks at a, a, a clear problem and tries to find a private sector solution to that problem, as opposed to saying, you know, this is public uh, sector responsibility. And I think that, you know, uh, uh, evidently we need to have a lot more innovation in, in the, the, we, they, they say we've got a decade left. So we're gonna have to really put on our thinking hats and come up with some interesting solutions to the huge scale of the problem that we're going to be facing. And I'd like to leave it there. Thank you, Michael. No, thank you very much. And, and again, I want to thank all of the um, participants who've, who've stayed with us. Typically, these sessions are one hour and, and end kind of promptly on the dot. And uh, we've been able to, to engage with you and share uh, insights with you uh, for longer, frankly, than, than we thought uh, we would when we were chatting as, a, as the um, moderator and speakers. 
I think though that, um, and, and I, I appreciate those who've shared their contact details as well, because we really do want to have this be the beginning of a conversation um, through Arise Africa, through, through PFAN uh, on the continent. Um, we definitely will, will continue to basically promote models such as the one that uh, Heather and her team and her colleagues are developing um, to raise the profile of resource institutions like PFAN so that the project developers know that there is a go-to organization that they can reach out to. Um, Harold, I'm thinking about your, your question about you know, modeling. Uh, we also want to create a platform continentally where things that are happening in Southern Africa can be shared with colleagues in East Africa and West Africa um, more fluidly and, and uh, in such ways that we can, we can, you know, there's South-South is often, South-South cooperation is often considered Africa to other parts of the, the, the Southern Hemisphere to speak but with the continental free trade area uh, having been launched this January, there's uh, also a pivot towards how can we find solutions on the continent for the continent. And so we are looking forward to uh, building from the Rise Africa uh, Festival and continuing this conversation in, in the weeks and months to come. So I wanna thank everyone for, for joining, everyone for uh, placing your name in the chat uh, or taking my email from the chat and let us know. And definitely Thavin and Heather uh, and Abilash and Absentia, uh, thank you very much for your very rich contributions to this discussion. Um, I think you, you've made it uh, a learning opportunity for, for, for all of us who've, who've tuned in this evening. Hope everyone has a great evening, great morning if you're uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, please do tune in to other aspects of the Rise Africa Festival over the coming days. Take care, everyone.